see a lot more of Peter Vandervarker's art uh, between now and April 30th. Uh, his exhibit called Building Geometries, Ge Geometries uh, is being held at the Cambridge Seven Associates uh, Gallery. Mm -hmm. And um, you can find out more about that right after here. But I'm certainly going to wend my way there, and you may want to do it also. <laughs> 1033 Mass Avenue, Cambridge. It is a wonderful exhibit. Very good. So I'm going to turn this back over to George, and uh, the floor is open for your questions. George Rush. Okay, great. Um, Barry, thank you. Can, you. can you all hear us? Yeah. You need to move the mic pretty close to yourself. Can you hear me now? No. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. No. yes. Yeah. There it is. Yes. You can take it out of the stand if you want. Uh, no, I like this kind of Conan O'Brien thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, 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 it's so interesting to, to hear the, the talks that we've uh, started out with, but I think um, Robert Campbell was alluding to some of the central contradictions or conflicts or challenges, I, I guess I'd say, uh, that we're facing now when we think about architectural in, in a global context. On the one hand, a kind of profound anxiety about cultural authenticity, that is, the realness of the place. Um, who hasn't had the experience that Robert was alluding to about finding a really unique place in a city somewhere else that you're not really f that familiar with, but that feels really uniquely different and fundamentally not like where you live? And it's, and it's, and it's great. Um, on the other hand, at the other, other end of the spectrum, it seems to me the forces for um, you know, when we talk about what kind of buildings we're going to be building, in, is it going to be KPF, that's Cone Pedersen and Fox for the uninitiated, or SOM, that's Gitmore, Owings and Merrill. Um, is it going to be these big global firms that are going to be designing, let's say, the tall buildings? Uh, or is it going to be some hybrid of local practitioners riffing on the innovations of these building types? I think this is a fascinating conversation because when we talk about energy, we talk about uh, some of the real energy-driven mm, uh, forces that are shaping our cities, we immediately start thinking about best practices and how to do things a lot more efficiently. And one wonders in that case whether it does, some level of standardization doesn't make some sense, right? In other words, we don't hand make our automobiles. Uh, we don't hand make a lot of other things. We, in fact, we, we, we try to, we put a lot of concentrated design energy into something, and then we build more than one of it. This is a direct kind of contradiction to the desire to have unique places. And I, I wonder if maybe folks on the panel want to talk a bit about that, and maybe the audience might be interested as well. Unique places don't have to be made out of unique parts. Um, you can manufacture a billion bricks and make a, a lot of different places. It's, a, it's an issue that I'm very concerned about because I, you know, we all have our biases and what I love is places. And what makes a place a place is its difference from some other place or it wouldn't be a place. And there has been a loss of interest uh, in recent years among architecture students and architecture faculties in the whole issue of place as they get excited about globalization and I live my life in airports, that sort of thing. Um, I have a theory which I will briefly uh, adumbrate, which is that uh, with every advance in technology, there is a loss of sensory experience. And you can take any, any, go from the fireplace to the central heating and air conditioning plant, you get the same thing. Or take transportation, you're on a horse, you're bumping up and down, the mosquitoes are biting you, it's raining on you, there's a highwayman around the corner. You're fully experiencing it with all your senses, uh, the world. A uh, generation later, you're on a train and the world is a film strip, purely visual, going by as you go on. Generation later, you're in an airplane, and the world is an actual movie screen down at the end of the aisle. Uh, and with it, I, I would argue that with every advance in technology, I miss my typewriter. I miss the bell that used to ring when I got to the end of the line, you know, and the smell of the ribbon. And so, for me, that's all about place too. You smell place as well as see it and hear it and touch it. Um, and so, I would, I would, I would always think we would ask the question: What are we trading away when we're gaining efficiency? Yeah, I, think I agree. I think this is uh, a core issue, the issue of authenticity and 
in creation of place, and, and I think it relates to the issue of identity. Uh, at some level, there's a, a contradiction uh, in the way our society is set up today, because uh, yes, I think people do have this rich desire and need to want to be different in some way, but yet part of something larger. Um, and unfortunately, what's happened now is that we're bound by the methods of production of our society. Um, and as it relates to architecture and city making, that means how things are built, who has the control over the mechanisms of how cities are built. I mean, think of the suburbs. In the suburbs, are, there's a kind of method that's used in creating the suburbs that, that relates to familiarity. So when you go to a certain intersection, you have the same kind of McDonald's, you know where you are, you don't have to think about it. Your mind is turned off to the sensory experience because it interferes with the potential to make more capital and money. And we're not conscious of that because there's this trade-off. Why? Well, this method of production has also yielded the iPad, which we were fascinated with now. It's kind of a, a replacement for our consciousness or a, a, a tablet which becomes a reflection of our own reality. And so we think. Um, and, and, and it's I only been out for two days, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I'm yeah. not sure we're, we have enough distance to fully assess it again. <laughs> it's over. It's over. It's over. Right. It's over. I heard on the radio today that you have to read at least 100 books on your iPad before it becomes uh, equal, right. e equal in uh, resource consumption to what the books were then. The, the Times did a, a, a good piece on it. And of course, if you borrow the books from the library. <laughs> okay. all, right, all right. Uh, I, I wanna, we want to engage the audience here for just a second, but I just, in the interest of uh, having this be a uh, energetic and fruitful conversation rather than an agreement festival, I will stake, stake out up here um, the territory that is uh, uh, arguing in favor of some measure of um, non-unique production uh, for our built environment because it's not, we can't make uh, every, everything uh, discrete and different and separate and, and, and unique, I don't think, if we are going to be, uh, face some of the other challenges that, that, that we face. So anyway, with that, sir, if you, have, you have a question. Thank you. Uh, I wrote down one please, phrase. Please also uh, identify yourself. Yeah. My name is Frank Davis from Brookline. I wrote down one phrase that Bob Campbell used, which I thought was uh, quite extraordinary. He said the buildings should respect and draw from the past a look to the future. And I asked each of the panelists to give me those structures that might be familiar to the audience that fall into that category. Folks, uh, I'm not happy to start. But please go ahead. Well, uh, I think there are they're not all. Um, obvious, uh, but I think there are some ones that respect certain elements of the past very well that are very new in Boston, and I would say um, one example would be the, um, the new Ritz-Carlton Towers down uh, in, on the edge of Chinatown. They don't look old, but they are street making, they are, they, they, they are very aware of a traditional urbanism that makes them superb uh, neighbors and a vast improvement over things that had been done in the previous 40 years, and I would the, say. And the Paramount is right up the street. Sure. Yeah. Two sure. hours making a fire. Sure. Good, good part of the city. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I love you, Bob, but you're, you're full of it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you want to ride your horse and buggy so you bounce along. It, 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 yes, with every technological advance, there is a loss in century input. But That's all right. it's over, dude. <laughs> H.R. Haldeman said it. The toothpaste is out of the tube. It's, it's not authentic anymore. It's different. It's all fuzzy and goofy, and everybody borrows everything else. And it's, you're not going to find that. And kind of, I'm sorry, but you know, it's, you got to. Yeah. Well, there, are, there are real differences, though. There are differences in climate. There are differences that, that architecture should respond to that leads to difference in different places. I didn't say I wanted to ride a horse, but in fact, we're going to do a lot more walking in the next generation or two, I think, because of the uh, uh, problems of, uh, of, of what our, you, uh, our coal and petroleum are causing in the world in all sorts of ways. I think we're going to find ourselves living in a more compact uh, society and getting around a lot more by bicycle. Half the I mean, talk about a contemporary country. What about uh, Denmark? Half the people in Copenhagen commute to work on bicycles. Uh, it's very healthy. It's very uh, non-polluting. It has a lot of advantages. So I, I don't agree with you at all. I think there, there, there are all kinds of forces that make for difference. And I think you have to 
if you're a sensitive architect, try to try to understand those forces and and, uh, and use them. It, one last thing, I will agree that Stuart Brand's book, the Whole Earth Manifesto, that the one where he argues nukes, genetic engineering, and cities, is <laughs> one of the best written books I've read in a long, long time. I Here think he's a genius. Wonderful and he used our pictures from cityscapes. <laughs> <laughs> How Buildings Learn by Stuart Brand. And it's a wonderful book about architecture. Also. Really good. Guy is a very smart man. But if I can answer or uh, put out a, a, an example of an architecture, I'd say a process of city making, which I think has been pretty successful by and large, is, is this campus. Um, having seen it all over the last uh, five, ten years in George, you know this better than anything. But Bill Ron, when he thinks, when he thought about the housing arrangement, the dormitories, he was very much influenced, for instance, by this study of, um, I believe it was Austrian uh, uh, housing typologies in the 20s. Um, and, and then the way, in fact, he built other projects on the same site, and like Tucson Wombs projects and so on. And you can, you really get a vibrancy now around Ruggles Street, so much so that we almost missed the lecture. Right. Too much traffic. Right. But, um, you know, I think it's a success to the process of city making that's happened here. Right. Yeah, I, I'm not answering the question because I think there are just so many examples, but I think that's a very good one. Um, the material is brick, and the brick is the size that you hold in your hand, and that's drawing something from tradition. The idea of the quad as a place where students gather and move in and out and back and forth. All of those things are part of the campus here. Um, a building that is much more radical in some ways would be Peabody Terrace at Harvard. And I know it's not always popular because most people don't like concrete, and I understand some of the issues there. But that, too, takes the older Harvard houses, which it's in, in a row with along the Charles, and, and using the quad, but creating higher densities and higher towers so that you can take advantage of the views up and down the river, uh, I think is also successful in that way. Yeah. Um, the, uh, Paul, what, does, what makes the Northeastern campus especially instructive in this uh, way, of course, is that these buildings all sit on the sites of what had been the surface parking lots of the former commuter campus. So it's like <laughs> completely, it's a perfect, it's a perfect story. But we have a question up here. Hi, my name is Judy Potts, and I have had the honor of going to China. And what I'm surprised about is that nobody mentioned Shanghai is a fabulous city. Most of it is only about 20 years old. And all the new buildings in, in the Pudong area look like an architectural contest. If you want to be true, it looks like an architectural nightmare. Most, I mean, it, it's wonderful to see a building that looks like a pineapple and one. You had the picture of it that looks like a, a bottle opener. Um, the beautiful, actual beautiful parts of Shanghai are the French concession, which is magnificent. Um, when you go to Beijing, the, the old the palace, the, the, forbidden, the forbidden palace. The Chinese architecture is gorgeous, and Shanghai, except for the old parts, has none of it. And the new buildings that they're building for people to live in are just these cracker boxes. So I guess I have to agree with Robert Campbell. They're losing something, not gaining anything. Right. Well, well, there's just a there's, there's a couple of things. Um, I mean, of course, one you know, I would say that one of the biggest challenges facing our country, facing all, all countries when it comes to urbanization, is that think of your favorite city. Think of the city that you've been to in the world that you think is the greatest. For some of you, it's going to be Prague. For some of you, it's going to be Paris. For some. It'll be another. But almost all of those were done way before democracy, and certainly way before participatory democracy. Okay? If you've ever, you know, I mean, and so this is actually, this is an issue because, you know, when you have a strong hand, you can kind of reconcile some of these things. You can get a whole district of a city that looks one way and maybe has an aesthetic character that more often than not can, can, can all work out. Um, what's funny about when you mention this campus, American campuses are one of the last examples of single author urbanism that I'm aware of. That is, there aren't other places in the United States anyway where a single author, in this case the president of a university who's good friends with a really good architect, um, can, can just happen to execute a plan over, you know, that cover, a master plan that covers some 25 acres in a city. 
you know, the last time we did that sort of thing, we didn't really like the outcome. It was usually all poured in place concrete, and it was done, you know, from 1955 to 1975. And I, I mean, this is a this is a real quandary. We have not found a way to balance um, the desire for everyone in democracies to have their own say, to have a lot of say over their own property and so forth, um, with our other desire to have a kind of cohesive built environment. These are fundamentally at odds, I think. And, 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 when, and what you see in China, I suppose, but certainly there's a street in Chicago where this happened and it's super hilarious. Uh, it was an old urban renewal block in a very nice part of Lincoln Park. And in the 1980s, um, uh, I, I can't remember, it's seminary, I can't remember what street it is. But um, somebody had a great idea that Chicago has a lot of excellent architects. Let's let an important architect design each house in this one block long street. Wouldn't that be a great idea? Of course, like the Shanghai that you described, That's it's Shanghai a fiasco. Like. You know, there's a pink stucco house <laughs> next to a glass box, next to a something else, and it's just, it, it makes for a terrible street. It makes for a high level of individual autonomy, freedom of choice, and so forth. But anyway, this, is a, this is an underlying structural issue, it seems to me, in the West. Well, I mean, it's, I think it's, it goes back to the issue of how do we make cities and how have they been made? So if you think of the case of Prague and other European cities of its time, the medieval city, actually, if you look at the plan, very often they're optimal representations of market forces. So what was the point of the market city? The market city was to get your goods as quickly as you could into the center of the market and sell them. Often, um, the gates would be closed, so instead of waiting until your goods perished, markets would develop around some of those gateways. And you can still see traces of those developments in places like Munich and other cities. And, but the difference between Prague, between Prague, Munich, and let's say Shanghai today is that the scale of intervention is controlled within the limitations of the building systems people use. So the standard shop owner or the developer could only build something that was so wide and so high and so on. And therefore, their, their, their developments were contained within those dimensional constraints. You see the same process evident, for instance, in Back Bay. Back Bay is a wonderful example of urban development plan where there's a lot of continuity relationship between buildings and a strong neighborhood. And the problem in Shanghai is you can do anything. There are, what are the constraints? So in the, in the age when we can do anything, how do we begin to put controls upon ourselves that are intelligent? But the core issue of authenticity. I, I, very brief. That's a very interesting issue. I think should the world present itself as having been made by one central intelligence, or should it present itself as having bubbled up from a whole lot of different people at different times with different points of view? I think you can strike a balance between those two things. I don't agree with George that neighborhoods have to be coherent in order to be places. Uh, the, the the DNA of New York City is that anything can happen anywhere. And you can have a one-story pizza joint and a 60-story tower making friends with each other side by side. That's the nature of that particular place. Right, but, and, and, and uh, you know, everything I know about architecture I learned from Robert Campbell. That said, <laughs> uh, uh, of course, I mean, and, 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 and if we were doing a studio on this subject, we, I'm sure we would be in agreement that there is a logic uh, built into, you know, New York is one of the most structured places, actually, that you're ever going to find, and it therefore allows for tremendous variation on each parcel because there's so much commonality uh, on the street. Um, you know, and we this is a this is a, 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 a well-established conversation to have in urbanism. But but you know, the more structured the block type, the more irregular you, ir irregularly you can make in each individual uh, building. And the Back Bay versus the South End is a great example. The Back Bay. Um, the lots and the blocks are all exactly the same, and therefore the buildings architecturally can be quite different and still make a very coherent situation. By the way, I'm not suggesting that all neighborhoods have to be like the Bay Bay, not at all. It's just, it's just clarifying. The South End is interesting to me because the blocks are different, but the buildings are the same. The buildings are all bow front, mostly, bow front brick buildings, dominant, certainly the dominant type, but the blocks, we go up to the top of the Prudential Center and, and show people, as I do often, it's really quite shocking how there's hardly a single block in the South End that's exactly the same as another. The, the Back Bay is a French model and the South End is an English model, and it's what we were talking about earlier about how you draw from the past. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Gerard Battler. 
at one point in high school, I was going to be an architect, but fortunately for the built environment that never happened. <laughs> we had a speaker uh, here a few weeks ago whose name I, I, I can't recall, uh, who, who uh, referred to the advent of, I think she called it, uh, anytime, anywhere computing. So you can access the world from your computer, your iPhone, wherever you are in the world. With the implications that uh, there would be tremendous growth in uh, activities like online uh, retailing, uh, uh, office functions could be done uh, remotely, uh, government services, you know, the post office, uh, those services could be provided remotely. Uh, education, of course, we've all heard about the advent of uh, distance education, even in medicine, we have the advent of telemedicine. So, I wonder, does the, the uh, expected growth of these kinds of activities online imply that there's less need for uh, physical spaces where people can gather to conduct those traditional activities, education, um, retailing, and so forth, office space? And um, does that mean that there's going to be a less demand for uh, great architecture and therefore less demand for architects in the future? <laughs> or is there something that's going to replace them? We're not really here. We're just digital. We're <laughs> avatars. <laughs> it doesn't need, you don't need us. Uh, my son finished uh, medical school at Penn. And at Penn, they, the first thing they say is, we don't care where you, whether you come to class. And these are the, the classes at the front end where you got to like, you know, cram it in and spit it out. You've got to learn all this stuff. So everything's online, every slide, every picture, everything. And so th there's, what happens is there's two kinds of learning. There's this stuff that doctors have to know about chemistry or whatever those things, the fundamental things are. And then there's the kind of interactive, you know, judgmental, you know, and that's the kind of stuff that you do on rounds and the, the personality and the, the FaceTime stuff. And they, they, and medicine is smart enough to make a clear distinction between the two of them, and they understand how to how to do that. I think they've done the best job of anybody. But but I, I think I've seen uh, I think I've even seen Robert write about it. But uh, uh, I've seen lots of pieces that suggest actually that all of this computing time, all this telecommuting, all these various things, increase the public demand for high quality physical interaction. And if you doubt it. Um, you know, think about the, the rise of the biotechnology industry in Cambridge, which could be anywhere, and indeed used to be many more places than it is now. Now it is all in Cambridge, globally, it's in Cambridge, and it's because those people want to actually encounter one another face to face, and many people argue that there's, this digital world actually creates a, a greater premium on face to face interaction. Now people expect, you know, I think as, 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 as perhaps, Perhaps they expect more authentic places. Perhaps they expect realer experiences. This issue is really engaging because, you know, with the rise of Starbucks and all these various things that have come along with the digital revolution, one thing that I can't help but notice is, and it's because maybe I spent uh, six months in Paris a couple of years ago, um, uh, you know, and I was hanging out at cafes there from time to time, as much as I could. Um, and of course, you know, I'm sure that cafe life has changed there from the time of, uh, the 1920s, but at the end of the day, it's still pretty, it's a super social thing. Mm -hmm. You go to the cafes in the United States, what's the thing you notice most? Everybody's sitting by themselves, right? And it's kind of shocking. There, this is a whole other conversation we could have about, there are some examples of, a, you know, if anybody's familiar with University Park in Cambridge, which is a, mm -hmm. was a very ambitious, very well-intentioned enterprise in the 1980s to make a really good quality urban development. And, I, and it had excellent architects, and Fred Coder was the master planning architect. I have great respect for him. And he used um, building types uh, to, that were um, drawn from basically kind of Parisian houseman type, type of building. They had a very clear bottom of the building that was going to be more open. They had a middle of the building, um, which would be the office space. And, the, and they would have a top that in Paris might have been the, the Garrett Apartments or something like that. But the trouble is, um, of course, that's not the uses that those buildings were put to. They were used for biomedical research buildings and stuff like that. And so 
the public square that they were defining doesn't, isn't really as porous. It's not lined with buildings that have openings at the bottom. It's lined with buildings that have a nice diagram, but that aren't really used the way the form. So there's a, there's a, a misfit between the form and the content of that sort of thing. And I think it's analogous to the one in cafes. And it's...